Thank you for attending our session today. My name is Chris Butler. Uh, I am Executive Vice President with IP Services, and we are going to be talking about zero trust and how it impacts fintech today. Uh, we do have a few folks that aren't necessarily in the financial industry, but there's a lot of here for everyone. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping. You should be able to uh, submit questions. We're going to go through our session with Scott. Uh, we expect his material to take 30, 35 minutes. We'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. But if you would, on your panel, you can submit questions. I will be reviewing those, and then I will be asking them for Scott to answer. So with that, can everybody hear me okay if uh, said something in chat or through uh, questions if you're having trouble now? I'll give a couple minutes for people to respond if we need to make some changes. Okay, looks like we're good. We're going to proceed now. Very briefly, a little bit of history on IP services. Um, this is my personal contact information. When this is over, please reach out to me. I will be get you uh, the slide deck and additional information that you might have. IP Services was founded a little over 20 years ago by Scott Eldridge. He is our founder and CEO of the organization. We are based in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, for over 20 years, we have been providing uh, excellence in cybersecurity and managed services. Really what our claim to fame is, is that we are able to come alongside your team and offload some of those things that are a challenge. And with what's going on in the world today with the great resignation, and everybody's struggling to keep up with the latest in cyber and the challenges, we can complement your team to work through that. Uh, where we really excel are organizations that have heavy compliance, and I don't think there's any more than that uh, in the financial industry. Uh, we have two tier three data centers, one in Oregon and in Pennsylvania, and uh, we were actually co-founders in the IT Process Institute, that was a founding some time ago, of, and you can see the co-founding partners that were part of that, that uh, really the whole purpose in its being was to establish some standards and some controls for people to be able to manage and function. IP services is heavy into ITIL, and that kind of takes me to this. Uh, many of you I know are live and breathe that, but if you're familiar with the Visible Ops uh, book series, uh, our founder, Scott, was very involved with that and produced that. Uh, it's really kind of become the cornerstone for many that consider best practices within the uh, cyber and IT industry. If anybody would like a copy, please reach out. I can get those for you. I'll even have Scott sign them for you before we send them out. But in a nutshell, cybersecurity and ITIL is woven into our DNA of an organization. Everything we do, it's all about process, people, and technology. Everything is done by the book, and it's all about process documentation. With that, I am going to pass the floor to Scott, a little bit about our speaker today. Scott Rose uh, has been a computer scientist at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, better known as NIST, since the year June of 2000. He got his BA in computer science from the College of Worcester and his master's in computer science from University of Maryland. Scott works on internet infrastructure protection research and internet protocol research. He is the editor of several IETF, Internet Engineering Task Force, uh, network protocol specifications, and the author of several NIST special publications on secure internet protocols. Scott's current work is bringing zero trust security understanding to the US government. He is, Scott is Mr. Zero Trust. He's the one leading the charge and defining the standards and the things that we're needing to do and keep up today. So with that, I am going to pass control over to Scott and make him the presenter to go through our deck today.
Scott, you should have control. All right, can everybody see that? All right. Um, I hope everybody can hear me well. Uh, like um, like he said, he said, uh, my name is Scott Rose. Um, I am part of the uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. I'm currently in the Communications Technology Laboratory. Um, and I'll be talking about uh, kind of uh, kind of an introduction to zero trust. Um, like I said, it's kind of been a hot buzzword uh, in the industry for the past few years. It's kind of even though it's actually almost several decades old by now, and even kind of predates a lot of this stuff. Um, and <clears throat> and so what what we've done at NIST was to try and uh, begin to develop kind of a, an introductory what we call a conceptual framework for zero trust. And I'll be talking a little bit about that today. Um, as well as what happens when you try to intersect zero trust and compliance, because they're coming at cybersecurity from from very different kind of angles. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're a direct conflict. Uh, that's one of those things is um, a lot of people, you'll see some of the promotional material in zero trust being that zero trust replaces kind of compliance. It's, it's we're, we're finally gonna get rid of the checkbox security. Um, that's probably not going to be 100% true. Uh, simply because they're looking at things from different angles, but that mean, doesn't mean that they can't coexist. Uh, and then I'll talk about some of the kind of what what's happening in Zero Trust, just to kind of wrap things up, and uh, and then we'll have some questions and answers. Uh, so originally, um, what is Zero Trust? We're kind of defining it as kind of a way of kind of architecting and designing your infrastructure, um, especially your IT infrastructure. Not exactly. Uh, it's not a single technology. It's not a single protocol. It's not a single product. You just can't buy, you know, uh, a, a license for zero trust, deploy it on your network, and you're done. Uh, it's actually more of a set of principles that you use to define your architecture and operate your infrastructure. Um, so, so there's not like a, a unfortunately, it's not a single bullet. Um, even though, like, so every every vendor out there um, now claims that they are these the zero trust solution. They, that is partially true. They are part of a maybe of a solution, depending on how you use your in your architecture. Uh, but again, everything is kind of uh, double-edged. There, you can take a quote-unquote zero trust product and use it kind of in a non-zero trust way, um, and still gain some sort of benefit. It's not uh, it's not as easy as simply buying something and following a manual. Um, but what we're kind of trying to do is kind of define both what are those principles in zero trust and define what zero trust is mainly for the government, but for everybody else. Uh, and how we kind of defined it, it is, uh, look down at the bottom, you see the diagram. You'll have you know, a computer, a subject, uh, as it's usually called. And it's in this untrusted zone because it hasn't authenticated itself yet. Uh, and it wants to reach the resource on the far right. Um, and so it has to go through this kind of a, a policy decision point or a policy enforcement point. That is the check. That is where authentication could be done. That's something doing that. That's the, are you authenticated? Are you authorized? Uh, are you allowed to access this resource? And once you're through, think of that as kind of like the bouncer at the door or you know the, the, the guarded gate at the facility. Uh, you enter in this was an implicit trust zone. You, you've passed all the checks, and so you're now trusted enough to reach the resource. And the whole goal of zero trust is to kind of shrink that implicit, tr implicit trust zone to make it be as small as possible. Ideally, uh, just encompassing that resource. In other words, if you ever want to access a different kind of resource, you have to go through another set of policy enforcement point, policy decision points in order to reach that resource. And there's never a time when you're you're allowed to run wild uh, over the entire enterprise. You know the the traditional view of a lot of internet infrastructure, a lot of enterprise infrastructure was you'd have the hard crunchy exterior with the firewalls and the DMZs, but once you got past that, you were free. You could almost you could ping, you could access, you could open up connections to any other machine that's that's on the network. And the whole idea of zero trust is you're trying to get rid of that model. Uh, you're turning it on its head, is which everything is considered about as safe. Uh, which is not as the internet itself. So everything is, the network itself is a contested um, fabric. You don't know that there's a hostile actor you know, at any time or an insider threat 
um, active on the internet on your internal infrastructure and your your enterprise owned infrastructure. And so the idea is that you have to you're constantly doing this uh, evaluation and authorization in order to continue uh, to get the individual resources. Uh, so once we did that with that definition, which is in the special publication 800-207, uh, again, there's the link down at the bottom. Uh, if you got a copy of the slides, you can just go right there, or you can just do a search for you know, SP 800-207, it'll probably come up. Uh, we, we broiled it down to what we call the, the tenants, which is really a set of principles. And they're kind of, you can almost map them one-to-one -one with some of the other groups of principles that are out there. I mean, Forrester has some, um, the uh, UK, the NCSC had their own set of principles. Uh, they all kind of basically say the same thing. Um, and they kind of break down the set of principles around user identities, um, or you know, sometimes we call them network identities because they're used when they're on the network to access resources. Some are device, device centric and some are kind of data or network centric, you could say. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of them. There's only, there's seven of them. I think they may be in the slideshow just because it's just a wall of text, but there's two key um, tenants where we, um, we kind of differ from some of the other definitions out there. Um, where we're, we're in device centric, the first one, all systems are considered resources. That way we kind of made that a little bit more general than some of the other uh, definitions and principles in that we consider not just data sources or um, as, as kind of resources. So it's not just databases, things like that, all things. You have compute resources, maybe in the cloud, you may have sensors and actuators from IoT. All those things are considered resources. So we want people to think a little higher than just um, you know, data sources like databases or, or web applications or something like that, or services, um, you know, kind of cast a little broader net and think you know, even the printer could be considered a resource. Um, and <clears throat> one of the ones that's kind of not in here implicitly is around data. Uh, it's the, some of them were that every, every packet or every, you know, every communication on the, on the network is inspected. Uh, we took a different kind of view from that. We're saying, you know, they're at least inspected, at least for the metadata. They may not be full deep packet inspection or what's called where the actual packet itself is analyzed um, simply because uh, as we're seeing right now, kind of a new protocols that are merging, that is not always possible or even kind of desirable. Um, you have to think there's different kind of regulations around different types of data. And some types of data may not be handled by people that aren't trained. Uh, one of the examples we give is, um, you know, some organizations and some agencies have things like employee assistance things where there's um, doctors or psychologists or social workers on staff. So they actually handle, you know, data that's protected by HIPAA. Um, you know, your, your IT staff probably shouldn't have complete view into that data as it's going across the network. Um, especially if they're not, you know, trained or, you know, know all the rules and regulations around, you know, handling HIPAA data. That doesn't mean that they can't look at the metadata, they can't see where connections are going and things like that. That all can be logged and used to further further refine policy, which is kind of a big thing in zero trust. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they should have access to all network data. Um, maybe they should, maybe they shouldn't, it all depends. And then there's also cases where, you may have contractors on site or uh, customers or something like that where they have they have access to infrastructure, uh, you know, network connectivity or something like that, um, but not necessarily want to give you access to all the traffic they're sending out. Um, you know, they have their own you know business processes and things like that that they would prefer to keep confidential. Uh, you may not have access to that, and it may be fine not to have access to that. Uh, it's the idea is you got to pick your battles and you got to take, you know, that's where you do your risk analysis of like, can I, can I let this encrypted traffic go through, um, you know, using only maybe just metadata or some sort of other kind of uh, machine learning to figure out, you know, is this data malicious or not and, and, or things like that. Um, so as you go further into the special publication, this is kind of the, the big meat of it that was, you'll maybe see in, in various forms and some sort of vendor presentations or other kind of uh, documents. Um, we're calling this the abstract architecture. We basically took that diagram on the, from the second slide there where we had the, the three entities and kind of exploded it uh, to show more functional roles. Uh, so in this case, you have a subject again. Um, well, first off, the infrastructure uh, in modern infrastructure and modern networks, it's split into two parts. There's the control plane and the data plane. 
Um, think of the, the data plane is where the app, app, actual application traffic is going through, you know, your browser traffic, email, whatever. Uh, that goes through the data plane. That's what the user data is. And it's the ones that are actually wants to reach the resource and back again. Uh, the control plane is kind of the administration part of that. That is used by the actual infrastructure itself, the network components, uh, to configure and operate the, the rest of the infrastructure. That's, you know, that could be your orchestration platforms, um, you know, your any kind of uh, management, network management utilities, those sort of things always kind of operate in kind of the, the control plane. Uh, but again, you have the subject using a system in the entrusted zone. Uh, they hit the policy enforcement point because they want to actually access that enterprise resource. So they have to go through a policy information point or PEP, uh, and then the policy decision point, which kind of operates in that control plane because it's doing a lot of the calculations. Uh, we split that out into two functional components. Uh, we're calling it the policy engine, which is kind of the decider. Uh, there's the one that actually makes the decision whether or not to grant access. And the policy administrator, think of that as kind of the executive uh, their job is to kind of actually set up the actual connection that uh, they inform the, the policy enforcement point to say, yes, let this connection through or no, deny it, or even terminate an existing, you know, previously valid connection. We think we've seen suspicious activity, you know, close that connection. Uh, and again, once they get through that policy enforcement point, they're in the trusted zone onto the resource. Uh, and then on the Left and the right side, these are kind of various data feeds that the policy engine uses to make that decision. Um, the, as a group, we sometimes started to refer to them as the policy information point uh, or policy information points. Uh, that's not a term that's actually in the special publication. It's kind of something that's kind of came out of it. Uh, and we kind of say, hey, that's, that's, a, that's a nice term to describe all these. Um, these are various data feeds that are, is used. You, know, you have um, CDM system is kind of a, is a government term for continuing diagnostics and mitigation. That's kind of your endpoint security, uh, endpoint management. You know, what's the health of the of the laptops or mobile devices that are used? Uh, any kind of industry compliance, um, which is you know any kind of overarching policies that need to be in place that are pushed out by industry that by the industry that you're in. Uh, for government, that could be FISMA or any kind of uh, you know, laws and regulations. I'm sure there's 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 some in the financial industry, uh, there's some in the healthcare industry, and there's all these kind of things that uh, that kind of push down policy or set policy. Uh, you'll have things like threat intelligence and activity logs. You know, those are you know dynamic feeds that change um, that can actually change some of the actual decisions. Uh, for instance, um, you know, active things that are happening, you know, active sessions that may be open, suddenly you'll get a threat intelligence feed that there's a new vulnerability or something, the endpoint that being used for this connection is now out of date or has been subverted some way because you see malicious traffic coming out of it. Um, that changes things. And then now the policy administrator closes that connection. And now, you know, the, the system is now denied. It may be taken offline and set, or set into some quarantine zone um, for further investigation. All that's very dynamic, um, or, or should be very dynamic, and that's kind of the one of the um, key points in zero trust. Um, you know, there could be something like a PKI, you know, for certificates and authentication, ID management system, that's your ICAM as well, um, and all of these kind of kind of data feeds feed in. Now, one of the uh, key points to consider in this is that this actually also exists in a non-zero trust world. Um, you always will have some sort of policy engine. There's always something making the decision, whether it's the actual you know, resource itself, maybe you can have local accounts on there, um, some sort of ICAM system, like um, that's, that's, that's authenticating users. There's something where there's encoded policy and there's something checking against that to do authentication and authorization. Zero trust kind of makes it more explicit and, and these things are kind of called out more and kind of also try to be more dynamic. And the idea, at least one of the, the hallmarks of zero trust is that you're using things like behavior, um, activities, changes in network, uh, changes in the environment. You could, you know, saying like suddenly, you know, geolocation, you'll see, um, you know, a, a series of access requests from one endpoint coming from, you know, the United States and suddenly you'll get an access request coming from Europe. Uh, you know, you know that they they, did, they didn't magically teleport over there in two minutes in order to do that query, so something must be wrong. Uh, and that could you know set up a signal, and then the SIEM system takes over and you know quarantine endpoints or whatever you want to do. 
or prompt the user for uh, re-authentication, um, things like that. That's that's kind of the dynamic nature of Zero Trust. Zero Trust is supposed to be more dynamic than um, you know previous kind of iterations where everything was you know configured and then set and then operating and then things had to be taken offline in order to reconfigure and things like that. Uh, further into the special publication, uh, we identify some what we call approaches and deployment models. Now, think of approaches are kind of what we, you know, I kind of refer to it as kind of like what's the load bearing, you know, pillar of their of, the, of kind of an inter, of, a, of an architecture. And there's three kind of major kind of um, uh, approaches that we've seen and architectures that we've seen that we kind of call out to help people kind of understand these. Uh, and it depends on what's considered the most important. Uh, enhanced identity governance is usually the easiest and and can be as only partially zero trust. That's where the most emphasis is being placed on the ICAM system. The ICAM is the is the uh, the king of kings. Uh, they're the ones that kind of dictate everything. Uh, that's uh, some of the earlier models of zero trust kind of use that is where um, the the network is considered open. Anybody could join the network, uh, but the idea is that in order to access actual corporate resources, you had to be authenticated and authorized, and it was all based on that network identity that was issued or managed by the enterprise. Uh, and so everything is kind of based around the identity. That's you know, sometimes you'll hear the identity is the new perimeter. These are these kind of enhanced identity governance, and the idea that there be a, also a set of rules around these identities and processes of you know issuance of identities, issuance of um, you know attributes uh, in order to authenticate and, auth and authorizations. And also what happens when a user identity is, is deleted. If someone leaves the company, what is the process to revoke that kind of identity from the various resources and, and, and don't grant those attributes anymore? Uh, Micro-segmentation and software-defined perimeters, they try to accomplish the same thing. It's basically those are uh, to limiting lateral movement, to kind of shrink those implicit trust zones. Um, the way to kind of keep them separate in the mind and the way we kind of do, uh, Microsegmentation tends to be kind of on the lower level. That's using the network, um, the network itself to kind of do things. Uh, and you're actually, so you're relying a lot more on your, you know, smart infrastructure. Those tend to be, obviously, then they tend to be more focused on on-prem stuff, but it could be in the cloud if you have actually that kind of control. Uh, it's where you're actually routing traffic at that kind of lower level. Uh, Software-defined perimeters are kind of more the higher level. It's kind of an overlay network over the top. Um, you kind of see some like these CASB solutions where you'll access like uh, some sort of agent on, a, on, a, on your laptop or endpoint. And then, then you'll get a list of, you know, the resources that you're allowed to access and then you can authenticate to each one and that sort of thing. That's kind of a, we say is an overlay. Those kind of uh, is, are, are more helpful when you have a lot of remote workers where you don't actually own the infrastructure because that means you can't, you can't manipulate the individual routes. You have to go over the top, and so you have to have these kind of you know, agent and uh, gateway kind of models where they they connect to some sort of cloud service that kind of manages everything. Uh, but again, they, they both try to do the same thing, and they both may be present. Um, in fact, they often are in kind of a full zero trust architecture, where micro segmentation will be maybe on prem, um, and then the software defined perimeter will be for the mobile stuff, you know, or or a mixture of both. You know, there's a there's a lot of gray areas there between the two. And again, the models that some of these things like Agent Gateway, like I said, is this tend to be very popular and it's kind of software defined perimeter models where you have an agent on the endpoint and the gateways that are basically the opposites of the, of the agents uh, in front of each resource kind of gating access uh, only when they're granted access by the policy administrator, that sort of thing. Portals, um, again, are kind of variations of the Agent Gateway model where instead of individual gateways in front of every resource that'll let you into a small kind of enclave of perimeters of, of resources sorry that um, those we've seen more often in legacy systems where there may not be um, you know the, uh, the the ability for that individual resource to kind of reach out into to manage kind of identities itself so it's kind of put it on its own little network perimeter with whatever else it needs to do its job and you just get access to that kind of network segment, almost like a VPN, think of it that way. Uh, and then app sandboxes are kind of the inverse sort of, of that, where you don't even trust the endpoint and you kind of sandbox individual applications, you know, and that sort of thing to kind of keep it separate. There's some OSs that do that, some Linux distributions where you can do that, uh, as well as some utilities that allow that on kind of other popular systems like Windows and Macs and things like that. 
okay, now uh, getting into the meat, um, you know, like I said, there's originally there was always a conflict between zero trust and compliance. Like, what did it mean? If I'm doing zero trust, does that mean I don't need to do these compliance checks, or you know, that that I'm I'm doing something better than these simply compliance checks? These compliance checks mean nothing. They're just check boxes. That's not 100% true. Um, it's the idea is they're trying to do, they're optimizing for different things. Zero trust originally, as it was proposed and defined, and as everybody kind of thinks of it, is very internally focused, is voluntary. I, I want to do a zero trust architecture. There, therefore, I do my own risk management. I do my risk assessments. Um, there's no controls around zero trust as we speak. Um, there's only the principles that you can't, you know, and they're very high level. So you can't really say, you know, I meet that check, you know, there's, they, it's really hard to prove because you're saying I'm, I'm going off of a set of just general design principles. Um, and then the implementation varies uh, for enterprise. There's no one right way to zero trust. We've seen everything from uh, fully kind of uh, virtual enterprise infrastructures where everything is in the cloud and all the, and every uh, endpoint um, is, is either a you know, laptop or someone has at home or mobile device or something like that. All the way to the other extreme, there's actually a small agency that does everything in-house. They have zero um, cloud footprint. They do not use cloud at all. They want a new mail server, they spin it up in their own data center. Uh, and they have this kind of wild zero trust architecture is kind of based on roles and everything. A lot of it they've homebrewed and a lot of it's based on kind of uh, what's available in the hypervisors that they've chosen uh, to run their data center. Um, but again, it's it's a it's a zero trust architecture. They've kind of been guided by these principles. Um, only they're not using any kind of cloud infrastructure. They don't have remote access and things like that. Uh, compliance again is the opposite. It tends to be externally focused. Um, you know, you go through compliance because you want to prove something. You want to prove that you've done it right. In other words, you so you have that kind of um, you know that that compliance has been passed. You've been audited. You have proof that someone, not not you, has said yes. You are doing things correctly. You have done the right risk assessment and things like that. Um, and those tend to be control based. I mean, I'm sure there may be some that aren't. Um, but I mean, there's like I know in the U.S. government, there's the FISMA controls and things like that. Uh, or for um, and lately for uh, contractors in the Department of Defense, and for instance, there's the controlled and classified information, the C and the CMMC kind of a regime there, and they try to aim for the consistency of outcomes. Like everybody, everybody at least meets this bar in order to pass the compliance. And again, like I said, there's the, this doesn't this isn't an either or. Um, you know, I I am under the belief, and I'm sure most of the cases at the time, if you have a zero trust architecture. Uh, you could meet, you know, and it is, it is, it is. You have done the proper risk assessment and things. You can meet probably any compliance. Um, now there is some weird inconsistencies, especially like I said with like the controlled unclassified information, and even some in um, like FISMA or uh, the cybersecurity framework. There'll be discussions and controls around things like remote access. Well, in zero trust, there's no such thing as remote access. All access is the same. Whether you, no matter where you're located in, on, you know, in the world on the internet, you could be remote working from home. You know, you could be at home. You could be on prem. You could be at a branch office. The idea is that the same set of policies apply no matter what. How they're implemented may be different. You could have some sort of micro segmentation um, uh, tool or architecture in place on prem, uh, or using some sort of CASB solution when you're on travel or at a branch office or something like that. Um, so the implementations may differ, but the actual set of policies, you know, is the, you know, uh, for the uh, security posture of the endpoint, uh, for the authentication checks, you know, multi-factor authentication checks, all that remains the same, no matter where you are. So the policies don't change. Uh, so the idea is that when you, so when you're looking at these compliance uh, controls that say, you know, all remote access is authenticated, you're like, well, you know, what does that mean? Because there's no such thing as remote access. Well, I would argue that you're saying all my access is remote access. So I'm going above and beyond that actual control. So not only are you know my my travel um, when people are in travel and, and phoning home and doing the work there, um, you know they sit there, you know their all their access is authenticated and authorized. Even when they come back on prem, all their access is authenticated and authorized. Um, so I'm doing you know I'm doing the full thing. So it doesn't really matter. Uh, and a lot of these, some of these, um, at least compliance regimes around, especially FISMA anyway, because that's the one I have the most influence or uh, knowledge of, 
recognizes this and are actually kind of looking at how do they change that? How do they get rid of those kind of just wording issues so they can say, yes, it's fine. Um, there are, I mean, for a while there was the opposite. They were trying to create a set of controls around zero trust and we kind of, you know, politely kind of dissuaded them from that notion saying that's going to be very difficult and so high level, it's going to be utterly meaningless. Um, let's just make sure that these compliance, um, the, the baseline and the actual individual controls that are in all these compliance checks for various IT systems can be met by zero trust architectures, not something strange, like you you need to have a firewall and, and everything else is under protected. I mean, that's kind of a weird control, but you could exist um, and that sort of thing. Uh, what are some of the gray areas that are still out there? Everybody will say zero trust is ready to go and it should be deployed now. Eh, not quite. Um, it's complex and we're back to complex systems, which we were never really good at. Uh, it's a system of systems. Uh, like I said before, you know, you have the, that policy engine and policy administrator. Chances are you're not going to have one. There's not going to be some sort of master control program, um, you know, that, that's going to run everything. Uh, what you're going to have is several. You're going to have your ICAM system. You're going to have your EDR system. You're going to have, um, you know, you kind of your network monitoring, network management system, your know, orchestration platform. All those may have a say in whether or not access is granted. So they may have veto power over each other but they're all enacting kind of a, an overarching enterprise policy. They're all just looking at just their narrow little facet of it. Um, and, and ideally, hopefully, um, they're all logging or, or centrally managed maybe. And so that way, you know, the, it's not like there's different teams and silos that don't talk to each other. There's kind of a centralized overall management and orchestration kind of managing these individual, individual systems doing the bits of their policy. Um, so that's, you know, especially in the, at least for resilience. Uh, and then we, we also would like to see something where we can kind of reduce vendor lock-in. Um, a lot of the zero trust solutions and vendors out there, um, you know, they have their own, you know, uh, technology obviously that they want to keep secret, but they only, only work with maybe certain partners and there's no kind of general data model or you could say or protocol or something to manage these kind of larger kind of meta um, protocols like you know ident around identity management event logging things like that there are efforts to do that to kind of open up uh, some of these kind of data models and, and protocols so you can have a more of a mix and match so you can kind of develop kind of a best in breed and actually plug them all in and have them work uh, without a whole lot of effort uh, but right now it's not there you kind of you're kind of locked into a family of vendors. Um, you know, if, if not just one, you may have, you know, th them and their partners. And if a partnership ever ends, then certain parts of your infrastructure may not work well with the, it again. Uh, and we're trying to get away from that. Um, again, IoT is always the problem, uh, simply because they're so low powered. They often don't have real identities. Um, you know, they, they, may have, they may have some identities, some don't, uh, or users or things like that. How do you manage those? How do you segment those away from everything else? We've seen things with like the Mirai botnet and things like that. There's things <laughs> that are uh, you know, still work going on in that space, especially when it comes to 5G. Uh, 5G, as we're seeing it now, it's just a fat, for the majority of time, it's just a fatter uh, data transport, which is, which is fine. You can just treat it like we've always treated it. Uh, but when you move to 5, uh, 5G um, standalone, uh, the network becomes a lot more, fine-tuned uh, you can do a lot of stuff there in the network to maybe actually help iot deployments um, and lastly you know, attacker and user responses and, and experiences um, you know we don't have enough experience with um, with successful attacks against zero trust enterprise so we don't know how attackers are going to adapt um, my guess is we're going to see a lot more phishing uh, but as we move to kind of phishing resistant MFA, now what? You know, there may be more emphasis on kind of attacking that control plane, or um, you know, or, or in some some other way of getting an insider intact, or something like that. I mean, how are they going to react when you know everybody turns on MFA? They're not just going to go home. They're going to try to uh, find a new way to conduct their you know, ransomware attacks or to get the access they want. Uh, and as well as uh, users, and we're breaking this down into two. Um, both how are the individual end users, you know, the, the people in the company that are doing business processes, how are they going to react um, to a zero trust enterprise now that they're being maybe being prompted for access more? Uh, maybe they're being asked, um, 
to to do some stuff. Uh, hello, yes. Yes, it's Chris. Can I pause for a moment? You put you've got yes. a few acronyms. We have a mixed audience within here. Um, would you mind just giving a quick definition of IoT and MFA and a couple of the acronyms you've used, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, please? Right. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um, IoT, Internet of Things. Uh, that uh, is a loaded term. <laughs> that is, that involves everything um, from maybe connected home appliances. Um, you know, you got to think your ring doorbells, your you know, camera security cameras, um, smart appliances in your house, uh, to things like printers. Um, that those are technically a thing. Um, that kind of uh, these are these are kind of like these sometimes low powered um, or kind of low compute power anyway uh, devices that are maybe single function that they they may have some network connectivity in order to get updates or upload some sort of data telemetry or something like that. Um, so they do have a network connection, but they're not a general computing platform like a laptop or a cell phone or, or a smartphone or something like that. So they can they're very limited in their functionality, but there's still a um, uh, you know a, a risk on your network. Uh, we have seen there's been documented cases of um, like an attacker in a casino. They gained their initial foothold in the enterprise architecture by subverting a, a, a temperature a gauge or a thermometer in a fish tank. Uh, but once they got access to that um, smart thermometer, they were able to move laterally through the network, and then eventually they got to the actual, you know, important stuff of the casino, and they were able to do a, I think, a ransomware attack is what they ultimately did, uh, as well as the Mirai botnet, uh, which was actually a series of uh, several manufacturers had vulnerable webcams that were then being used to launch a massive denial of service attack uh, that took down several key infrastructure um, parts of the internet. Uh, and they're only going to get bigger. As we see more and more things connected to the internet, they're going to get more and more bigger. Uh, but anyway, yeah, IoT can't do uh, MFA or what we call multi-factor authentication. Um, that is, you know, um, both, you know, that, that's kind of the thing that you see Google and a lot of these um, other large organizations moving to, where it's not just your username and password to get a, access or to authenticate yourself. It's something you are, it's you, something you know, that's your password and something you have, which could be, you know, maybe a token or a smart device or something like that. It's another way of authenticating yourself. Um, sometimes it's like an app, uh, special, there's, there's vendors out there that provide a certain sort of application that you can install on a smartphone. So when you log in into a laptop to a web application, it'll send then a prompt to your smartphone. So now you gotta have, you know, now you have two devices. So it's not just someone stole the laptop that happened to be logged in and then they can they can go to this web application. They'll have to steal the smart the laptop and the smartphone and know the password in order to get by. So they have to have multiple factors in order to to um, to authenticate yourself. And we're seeing different ways around there. And some of these are what we call more phishing resistant than others, um, including uh, a lot of these are like these application based, like I just mentioned. Um, things that aren't quite as good, but are better than nothing, um, especially when you're dealing with customers um, or um, or partners or something like that, where you where you can't issue hardware tokens or ask ask them to install an app, you know, another yet another application onto their smartphone, which they may not even have, uh, would be something like uh, the um, the text messaging or the SMS uh, multi-factor, where uh, I'll log into, you know, um, say my a web portal, you know, into to get into the web application, and then I'll get a text message on my phone with a number, and I'm supposed to type that number into the web page to prove that I am who I am. Uh, it's usually just another challenge uh, to further authenticate yourself, and so all that is being kind of rolled out. You see, not just from employees and contractors in an enterprise where you know you kind of have a pre-existing relationship. Or you know, it's you know, you're an employee, so you you have to rely on the enterprise infrastructure. You have to rely on what the enterprise gives you. But also, we're seeing this with um, you know, uh, maybe uh, customers, collaborators, business partners, those where the relationship is a little different. It's not just you're not just an employee; you're a customer. You know, so there's only so much you can ask a customer to do. Um, you know, because you can't ask, you know, can you really ask them to install this application? They may want to um, because that if that gives them a greater feeling, a sense of security, if they know that it's yes, it's it's reducing phishing. Attackers are less likely to compromise my account to get access to my funds. 
if I install this application? And then the other side is, well, if I install this application, are you tracking me? What else are you doing? And that sort of thing. So there's sometimes these hesitancies. And that's what we're not 100% sure of. You know, it, even uh, when it comes to employees, if you, um, you know, in, the, in, in several enterprises, you may have the, the bring your own device um, you know, allowance where you're allowed to use your personal equipment to, to conduct work and to do business processes, you know, access your email or look at your calendar uh, when, you're, when you're not at the office. When you start deploying more multi-factor things, um, you know, are the employees going to balk at, you know, being asked to install some sort of mobile device management utility or something like that? Um, then that's what we're we're not 100% sure of. You know, there hasn't been any kind of good studies about the usability factors around uh, a lot of the zero trust stuff, because it is kind of new. It is kind of rolling out. We haven't kind of we've seen some like it, some don't. Um, but again, also not just for users. And you know, you got your customers and you got your your average employees. There's also the administrative factor. Um, some of these zero trust solutions you're seeing out there are starting to deploy some of these kind of machine learning and, and AI kind of solutions where they'll look at, um, they'll, they'll model behavior, they'll look for anomalies, um, which are one thing. They can look at, you know, look at behavior and track of like user access patterns and things like that. And if they see something out of the ordinary, they could raise a red flag to the incident center and then they could investigate. Some are taking that a step for, further and saying, the uh, the machine learning model or the AI should then actually take action itself. It should then close the connection, or it should it should prompt for more authentication, something like that. Uh, and that's where things get a little hazy <laughs> when it comes to some administrators, uh, because you're asking them to take responsibility for an automated process that they don't really know how it works. Uh, and then that it kind of gets um, that's when it gets kind of squishy. You know, they say that's great. I like I like being automated. I like you know being able to use uh, automated tools to deploy my infrastructure and manage it. But do I really want it making decisions on my behalf, knowing that they're the ones that are going to get yelled at or you know pay the price if something goes wrong? What if you accidentally terminate you know connectivity that is valid, but looked a little suspicious at the time? Uh, and then. And that's one of the things that actually hasn't been been kind of studied is what it, what happens to the the human managers of this. You know, you're even you know from the CISO down, like how do they feel about um, basically you know, robots taking their jobs? Um, but uh, on the more practical side, um, there is this kind of uh, there's the national the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, the NCCOE. Um, it is a public-private partnership. Um, operated by NIST and the MITRE Corporation right now. Um, and they do a series of projects. And what they do is they do um, kind of these building block projects where they try, they demonstrate a set of, of um, cybersecurity capabilities uh, and they show with vendor partners. So what it is is NIST, um, the, NCC, the NCCOE itself, and a collection of vendor partners. And these are you know major corporations that join on individual projects and they demonstrate using those vendor products how to meet a set of cybersecurity requirements. Uh, one of those uh, new ones is implementing a zero trust architecture, uh, which has, I think, uh, 22 vendors right now. Um, uh, I'm a subject matter expert there. I'm advising that project. I'm not the project manager. Uh, that is Alper Kerman. Um, there's, you can probably see on the right there if you kind of squint. Um, that kicked off uh last july or, or july of 2021 uh it says it's expected to run 18 months probably going to run about two years uh but, but what it's actually doing is mainly because it, we're actually building um kind of mock enterprises in the lab so we're we have our endpoints we have our endpoint management utilities we have network monitoring we have cloud um uh, cloud footprints and kind of the and the vendor cloud providers uh, we have SaaS, we have CASB solutions that want to participate. We have mobile device management solutions that want to participate. Um, all these are kind of being built into kind of a series of these enterprises. And we're migrating kind of a, what we call like a brownfield to a zero trust architecture using these products. And we're demonstrating a set of use cases uh, mainly focused around um, uh, user access to resources. So you, we're, we're having enterprise um, ID, IDs or we're enterprise issued IDs, think of it that way, 
a group we're calling other IDs, uh, which are uh, contractors, customers, business partners, someone that doesn't have the same like domain. So if I, if I'm given an, an a, as for instance, I have a my network ID at NIST is got.rose at nist.gov. Um, but if you know people that don't have nist.gov have somebody else that issued their enterprise their their identity. And so how do you how do you relate to those? How do you authenticate those and those sort of things? Um, so that's that's what those kind of use cases are built around. And what's going to happen is <clears throat> uh, they're they're going to produce a a multi-volume document. Uh, they're called the NIST Special Publication 1800 series. It's actually going to be 1800-35. Um, some of the drafts are out right now. Um, they are kind of like the uh, to, to demonstrate how it was done. So they're going to list all the vendor products that were used uh, and give a brief description of how that that product was integrated into one of these mock enterprises and then show here are the tests we ran, here's what happened and that sort of thing. So it's gonna be, it's a, um, it's a massive thing. There's like the executive summary volume, there's the description volume, which kind of describes the products and the mock enterprises. And then there's the volume C, which is often kind of the most interesting one. Those are kind of more of a how-to cookbook sort of thing that actually will just go through the steps of saying, here's the product we use and here's how we configured it to work in this environment. Uh, and then D and E are kind of like, here's the tests we ran, and then there's going to be an E, which talks about compliance, um, that they believe that their final demonstration will meet. Uh, but that's that's kind of going on right now, and some of these documents are available right now. Uh, but lastly, one question we're always asked is, how do I start all this? This sounds great. Um, my answer always is, is is people first. It's not, like I said, is zero trust is not a single technology. It's not a single protocol. You need to get everybody on board first. Um, and that's to do your kind of risk analysis. And that is not just the IT staff. It's not just the security staff. Well, first of all, you know, sometimes the biggest obstacle is just getting those two to talk. Um, but you also need to get the, you know, the owner of the business process. You know, who who actually does these business processes? In what order do they access these resources? You know, you actually have to know um, you know, who is on the network, you know, what are they using on the network, where are these resources located, um, and how do they access these workloads? You know, how do they how do they actually do a business process? You know, what is the order? You know, do they have to go to this web application first, uh, and then that goes to this database? You know, everything kind of has to be kind of mapped out. So you have to kind of know what's going on before you can actually set, you know, intelligent sounding policies around this. Um, and then strangely, you know, going to kind of go high and low. Look at what are some of the high value assets. Uh, so what we call them, you know, keys to the kingdom is another term. What's the most important thing, you know, in the enterprise? And what are the most important flow workflows around that? And then work on securing those, you know, because that's, you know, start with uh, the most important things first. Um, but then again, you can also look at some of the low hanging fruit first. Um, and, or, you know, especially maybe around these high value assets. Uh, and we found usually, you know, ID and asset management tends to be kind of easy, easiest. Uh, that's, you know, not maybe not true everywhere. But look at identity governance. How are that? How's that being done now? Well, um, how many identity stores, as you could say, are, are located in the enterprise? Is there a central um, directory? Is there a central like database where all the user identities and passwords and all that are stored? that everything uses kind of a single sign-on solution to kind of access and, and, and outsource the authentication? Or is it being individually managed at every resource? Every web application, every SaaS has their own you know, interface where you have to create accounts and maintain those accounts. Um, and if they do, is there some way of kind of consolidating those? Because the idea is you want to have this kind of ease of identity governance. So when somebody joins the enterprise, you know how quickly can you uh, assign them an, you know, an identity and get them authorized to use the resources they need in their business process? And the reverse, when someone leaves or a business uh, partnership is broken, how quickly can all those accounts that did have access to resources, how quickly can those be revoked and, and, and secure that way? Um, getting started around, getting your hands wrapped around that first is usually kind of the most important and that can probably solve a lot of problems. Uh, and then second, you know, monitoring is the other one. Um, you can't protect what you can't see. Uh, you know, investing in a kind of a good seam or a good log monitoring um, solution will can bring a lot because that'll at least get you to know what's what's happening on the network, and that'll get you to identify these kind of vital workflows and things like that. 
Uh, but the most important thing, if anything, in all this talk is that you know zero trust is not a process, it's not a technology, uh, or it is, it is a process, sorry. Uh, it is, it's a process, it's kind of a, a, a way of looking at the world. It's not a single solution. It's not something where you can stand up and say, we're now zero trust. Um, it's something that's always need to be continually worked on because not everything can be zero trust right now. I mean, everybody's kind of working towards that. Um, like I said, like like Internet of Things, like printers and things like that. There's no good solution right now. There's a series of okay solutions, but everything is changing. Um, and it's not something that you can just, you know, buy a product off the shelf, install it, or, you know, pay a service for a SaaS product and, and you're good to go. It's something that actually has to be used and has to have a set of policies around that developed to use that properly. And that's the that's the end of the prepared slides. Um, like I said, there's my email address. Um, and we there is NIST uh, Twitter um, and the NCCOE uh, URL. Um, not directly connected with uh, the actually the Twitter or anything like that. Um, but it could be reused also to reach us. Um, but again, the easiest way to, to reach me at least is, is via the email address there. Okay. Scott, I'm gonna take control back. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, now's your opportunity to ask questions. It's not often that you get the opportunity to <clears throat> ask some of your cyber questions and concerns to someone of uh, Scott's caliber and pedigree and experience. Um, but a couple that did come through. Scott, where do you see, um, or how does Zero Trust account for problems with ransomware? How do you see that playing out? Um, well, two ways. Um, primarily, uh, Zero Trust tries to identify or tries to focus on some of the, the initial um, exploit. Um, so you're you're looking at things like um, you know phishing, anti-phishing solutions, um, and lateral movement. Uh, that's the idea is that uh, you know the idea is that once someone gets the initial foothold, either by somebody clicking on a phishing link or finding some sort of zero day again, like like I said, like in that thermometer in a fish tank, they compromise or get a get a foothold in the infrastructure somehow, and then they move laterally until they find an account that has access to the resources they actually want, and then they conduct the ransomware attack or something like that. Um, I think there's CrowdStrike or something, and one of the reports they came up with a number they're saying between that initial compromise to the actual attack, the exploitation being the ransomware attack or the exfil of data. Is has been on an average 90 minutes, uh, which is an incredibly short amount of time. Uh, so the idea is, well, try to expand that. The longer you can make that, the longer more time it takes for them to kind of move laterally, especially if you can prevent most of it. Um, the more time they have to to to, to trigger tripwires uh, and raise red flags, and the quicker they are to to be detected. Um, kind of another example story. Um, the hospital had, uh, and this is an you know, example that happens all the time. Uh, for instance, the, the hospital had a um, uh, did a zero trust enterprise. They did a micro segmentation of all their kind of networks for all their connected equipment, and they had a contractor come in to do service on I think it is an MRI machine. Um, so they came in, which you know has a computer to run everything, and they determined the best way to fix the problem was to replace the hard drive. They didn't put a new hard drive in. They put one they pulled out of an old, older machine. And they slid that in, powered it up. Well, it turns out that hard drive had not patchy on it uh, because it was in an old hospital that that had succumbed to it. Um, so immediately it fired up and started doing its thing, where it's trying to reach out and kind of sending all these kind of network queries to try to find, um, you know, the identity, uh, the Active Directory or something like that. I think that's how it works. In order to escalate privileges to then do ransomware against, you know, vital data sources. Um, but since they had this kind of micro segmentation architecture, uh, it couldn't easily send out these queries for things. And it was triggering all sorts of alarms down at their, their SOC um, and their network operations center, both of those, they're kind of combined. Uh, they were immediately say, okay, this is it. This is new. It's coming from this IP address. It's this machine right here. They immediately kicked it offline and they were able to, to, to clean it. And they got the, the contractor to put in a fresh hard drive. Um, that sort of thing is kind of, you know, that's what Zero Trust is supposed to do. You know, it's supposed to detect these, it's kind of make it difficult for an attacker once they get through that initial 
perimeter in this case you know locked in through the door but it could be something as like a phishing email or a zero day on some device um, to then move and escalate privileges you want to be able to detect that and stop that uh, before they can start actually uh, before they actually launch kind of a the, the ransomware okay i think you may have kind of answered that but i'm going to ask another one since we have so many financial institutions in our audience today um, but where do you see zero trust positively impacting financial institutions uh, especially with some of the new guidance that ffiec has uh, announced uh, what where do you see that going for them specifically um i don't i don't know for sure but i could probably see i mean if, if i were to guess based on what i've seen everywhere else and in, in other industries um you're going to see kind of a dual prong you're going to have um, vendors approaching from the from the ground up saying, "Hey, there's this new thing, zero trust. It'll you know increase your security," uh, and they'll be looking. You know, some of them are just looking to make sales. Some are kind of more interested in in helping. Um, you know, that your mileage may vary there. Um, and then you're going to maybe see it from the top down too for these kind of like the regulatory regimes that come through. They're going to say, "We we want you to move more towards a kind of a zero dark trust architecture." Hopefully they'll be wise enough to know that they can't just say, here's a list of zero trust stuff, do it. Um, it'll be more of, we're gonna tailor the existing kind of compliance regimes uh, to, to allow or to encourage more of a zero trust um, architecture, maybe encouraging things like, you know, um, uh, encrypting all data in transit, just both internal and external, you know, authentication around APIs, you know, those sort of things like that. Um, and that'll kind of encourage that growth. That's kind of how the U.S. government is sort of doing it. Um, and also, you know, as zero trust kind of gains foothold in other industries, I mean, this is kind of a second order effect. The average person will kind of become more tolerant of what's expected of them, or at least what they, you know, what they do. And like I said, that's the whole the customer thing. I mean, customers customers want security, um, you know, and and if they are used to doing certain things, like before, you know. I would say now almost uh, all the financial services like I use or uh, personally used or, or anything, a lot of the other services I use now are using some sort of multi-factor around like SMS or some sort of token or you know, Google has their own thing. Um, I've kind of gotten trained to expect that now. And so when I see it, I'm like, all right, I'm not gonna complain. I know this is for increased security. In fact, I kind of like that, um, but I'm you know, kind of a, I'm kind of a special case. I mean, I kind of know why they're using it, but I think majority of people, they're going to start kind of getting used to that. And they'll be like, hey, they might grumble at first, but they're going to get tolerant because they're going to see it everywhere. Um, so it's just going to be one of those things. You're just going to be used to, of course, I use multi-factor now. You know, and of course, I'm supposed to click on something on my cell phone, even if I'm on my laptop, uh, because I want, they need to make sure it's me. You know, I need to maybe use my face, you know, hold my phone up to my face to, to do a facial scan when I'm trying to access my bank. Um, you know, at least they know it's me, you know, sort of thing. And then maybe it'll give them an extra sense of assurance uh, in order to use kind of uh, more online services and things like that. Great, thank you. Uh, we've got a couple minutes left here. If anybody else has some additional questions, now is the time to get them typed in on the panel and then I can ask them for you. Uh, but very briefly, uh, I guess this is kind of the blatant commercial that uh, IP services, we are helping our clients, especially the uh, ones in medical and financial, uh, move towards these places. As Scott said, there is no silver bullet. It's all about process. And just that kind of fits into our whole ITIL philosophy of people process technology. Have your processes and procedures in place and make sure you follow them. Uh, that's critical. And that's where we can dovetail in with organizations and take the security monkey off of your back. Uh, as you saw here today, there's a lot of changing landscape and things that are coming down and it's almost impossible for people that are wearing a lot of different hats to be able to keep up with the whole cyber demand that's in there. And that candidly is the whole IP services wheelhouse. That's what we do, that's what we're good at, that's our DNA. Any parting words, Scott, uh, for our audience? Um, I said no. Um, I guess you know again, stress. You know, zero trust is 
a mindset of risk analysis and risk management. It's not um, it's not meant to be highly technical at first. You know, to get to get the the you know to get started and to fully understand it, it's it's not a, a technical question. It's more of a mindset is to evaluate your risk and respond accordingly. Perfect. Thank you. All right, it is straight up on the hour. We promised we would have you for an hour. I do encourage you, if you would like the slide deck or some additional information, we can get it to Scott. Um, uh, I would love to have a follow-up conversation. My email is on the screen. My phone numbers are on the screen. Uh, please reach out, I, uh, and uh, we'll take care of it. That is all we have. Thank you again for attending. Uh, we are going to probably do another session in January that's going to revolve around compliance and some of the regulations that are coming down the pipe. We're starting to see that some of the governing bodies, state and federal governments, are starting to uh, put things into some of the regulations. And it is, uh, there's going to be some more accountability that's coming down the pipe. So we're going to be talking about that in January. So look for that in the emails. We'll reach out and keep in touch. And if this was helpful to you, spread the word and let people know about us and that we're going to try to be doing these kinds of things with this level of caliber of presentation on a quarterly basis at a minimum. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day and a safe Thanksgiving as you travel. God bless.